Good morning, Hope Astoria. Thanks for tuning in to our service this morning. Let's join our hearts together in worship. Let's give it all that we've got. Let's use the words to this song and the melody of this song as a prayer to let the Lord know, to let the Lord know that we are hungry, that we are desperate. Oh God, would you fill our hearts this morning? We tune in, not just because we have to, we tune in because we need you, because we love you. Would you give us what we need today, oh God? A fresh touch from your spirit. Come Lord, come Lord. Let's sing this together. in, press into God this morning. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Fix your eyes on Jesus. And the things of this world will grow strangely dim. We are hungry, Lord. We are hungry, Lord. Let's sing it again. Living for 
wants you to know, God, that you are all this heart is living for. I'm falling on my knees, offering all of me. Jesus, you're all this heart is living for. Jesus, you're all this heart is living for. Jesus, you're all this heart is living for.
you're always with me. You're good. You're just to think about the nature, the character of Jesus, his humble nature. Oh, how we need humility today. Would you fill us, oh, spirit of God, the living God, and make us just like Jesus. Transform our hearts.
May others see you in us. Humble King, humble King, we bless your holy name. Jesus, we worship you. We praise you. We praise you, Lord. God, we are amazed that you come to us in gentleness and loving kindness and in humility. Though you're Lord of the universe, though you're sovereign over all, though you're in command, and yet, Lord, you show yourself humble. You describe yourself to us in your word as humble. You tell us that gentleness is one of the fruit of your spirit. Father God, we thank you. We thank you because we're all, Lord, in need of your tender care, your gentle touch. Father God, I pray that for all of us, wherever we're at, wherever we're in need of that gentle, loving kindness, may we experience it from you this morning. And even right now as we pray, would you be touching hearts? Would you be encouraging hearts and minds with your loving kindness, your gentleness and humility? And Father God, as we're healed by you, as we're encouraged by you, would you also form us and shape us into your image, into the likeness of Christ, that we would have humble hearts like yours that we would seek to interact with each other and love each other with humility, with servant-heartedness, that we would follow in your footsteps. Father God, we worship you. We thank you for the model that you set for us, for how you show us what is right and good and who you are. Worthy are you of all our praise. You are holy. You are good. We trust in you. We praise you. And we pray in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Well, welcome to Hope Astoria Sunday Service. My name is Denise. I'm one of the pastors here on staff. And as we uh, are here in a space of worship and of prayer, we really want to encourage you today that if there is anything at all that you would like prayer for, our prayer team would love to pray for you. Uh, you can see the Zoom link uh, pasted in our YouTube chat and uh, from 10.30 when the service premieres until about five minutes after service ends, our team would love to pray for you for anything at all that might be on your heart. In addition, each Sunday the team gathers and just tries to listen to see if there's anything in particular the Lord might put in their hearts uh, to pray for us uh, this morning. And so um, they're going to be putting the words into the YouTube chat as I'm speaking. And so I really want to encourage you to take a look at those. If any of those resonate for you at all or even a bit, please don't hesitate to, again, just hop on that prayer team Zoom and our prayer team would love to pray for you. Um, all right, well, with that said, we've had a little tradition started where we, uh, during this time in our service, encourage everybody to hop on the YouTube chat or hop on your phone, reach out to a friend, let someone know you're thinking of them, wish them a happy Sunday, and just uh, do everything that you can to, to continue to stay connected in this season. Uh, if you're new here, we want to give you a very warm Hope Astoria welcome. We are so glad that you're tuning in to our Sunday service stream. Uh, I would love to get a chance to connect with you. Uh, if you would like, you can email me at denise at hopechurchnyc.org, and we could uh, hop on Zoom, get to know one another, answer any questions you might have. It would just be great to, to get a chance to connect. And uh, if you would like to give, you can do so online or through the mail. You can learn all about that on our website. All right, with that said, uh, we just uh, have one announcement for you today, which is that we want to, again, uh, just let you know that we do have some plans uh, for moving towards in-person gatherings this summer. Our lead pastor, Chris, sent out an email to everybody that we had emails for. Uh, and so uh, if you did not get that, uh, please feel free to reach out to me again, Denise at HopeChurchMYC.org so that I can add you and make sure that you get updated as we continue to move forward in our plans. I'm sure we'll be sending more updates uh, as the time draws near. Uh, so we're thinking about uh, beginning to live stream again from our Sunday location, Legal Outreach, in mid-July, and then uh, a few weeks after that, beginning to gather again as a congregation. Uh, very pared down and reduced capacity. Probably RSVPs will still be needed, just according to whatever the state guidelines are. 
at that time. And all of this is, of course, subject to what happens with COVID and if rates continue to remain low and things like that. So we'll monitor and adjust uh, if and as needed. But we wanted to, to give you a heads up. We're so excited to be able to, uh, at the, just the prospect of being able to gather again. We have missed being able to gather in person. Uh, and so, so yeah, so we want to just uh, spread the word and, and, and put that on your radar. All right, so with that said, we want to move forward in our service now to our message. We have been in a sermon series on the life that we long for, the life we long for. Would you welcome our lead pastor, Chris, as he continues us in that series now. Good morning, Hope Astoria. Pastor Chris here. I'm so excited to begin our week off in worship, gather around God's word. I want to welcome family, friends, guests that are joining us as you find us in the middle of a sermon series titled, the life we long for. In this series, we're exploring the tension that exists between the life that we're actually living in our day-to-day -day experience versus the life that inwardly we long for, a life that's only made possible through Jesus. And so we're going to look to study the life of Jesus in all of its nuances, the details, the grit, and we're going to believe that God is going to teach us some powerful things that are going to lead us to actually living a life that we inwardly long for. We're going to be looking at a passage of scripture. It's arguably one of the most important passages in the New Testament because of what it says about Jesus. And in particular, we're going to segue from these opening verses in John chapter 1 toward a key verse in chapter 1 verse 14, where it really leads us into the focus of our time this morning. The scripture reads as follows, John chapter 1, verse 1 and onward. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Going down to verse 14, it says, The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Would you join me in prayer? Lord Jesus, we ask that as we open up your word, we pray you would open up our hearts. Speak to us. Help us to meet you powerfully this morning. Holy Spirit, would you reveal Jesus in a powerful and transformative way? And may our hearts grow in love and surrender to you, Father. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, going back to ancient times, it was a practice of men and women, but predominantly men, because men were kind of the power brokers, much more in ancient culture, that they would gather in the city center or the gates of the city. And powerful conversations would happen. Decisions would be made uh, at those places. And so if you were somebody who was trying to get stuff done, if you had influence, that's where you would go. You know, in our city, there's similar spaces, but you, I want to introduce you to one space where a lot of key conversations happen that you may not even be thinking. It may not be on your radar at all, but I have found if you want to hear the thought, the heartbeat of New York City, the, the, the embedded New York City, the New York City that's not coming and going, those that are here for the long haul, for good or bad, here's where you need to go. You need to go to Dunkin' Donuts. That's right, the, the people's choice of coffee. This is not highfalutin coffee. I have friends that are quite the coffee snobs. Even though I can be one at times, uh, uh, Dunkin' Donuts is not beneath me by any means. I love a good cup of Dunkin' Donuts. And over the years, I've actually worked from Dunkin' Donuts on many occasions because they got free Wi-Fi. And again, their coffee's cheap and I could set up there. Being there has let me hear some of the most amazing conversations, one that I'll never forget. It was uh, kind of late, and at night, there was a group of Arab cab drivers. Um, I, I suspect that they were from primarily from Egypt, because uh, one of them actually was talking about Egypt, 
and they were all kind of resonating in their experience growing up in Egypt. Thankfully, these men spoke English, so I was able to actually follow with the conversation. Now, mind you, I wasn't trying to eavesdrop. They just talked really loud, which I appreciated because it was an amazing conversation. You know what they were talking about? They were talking about us, followers of Jesus. And they were nitpicking and tearing apart the question of, are they true believers? Do these people that call themselves Christian actually truly believe? Would we consider them faithful? And I got news for you. They began to pick apart some of our moral choices, some of our personal decisions, and, and they began to try to reconcile. Can we actually believe that these people are real, given some of the discrepancies, the hypocrisies? It was a fascinating conversation, especially because they lumped us in with every single kind of Christian that exists in the world. And so I walked away from that conversation, and I never forgot the tension that they were wrestling with, which is what makes a true believer a true believer? And toward that end, I think we need to kind of process some things. And here's what I want to submit to you. I believe that for too long, we have accepted the truths that Jesus preached without embracing the lifestyle that he modeled. See, Jesus didn't just come to declare truths. He actually came and embodied those truths in the way he conducted his life from morning till night throughout the seasons and the years that we have recorded history of his life, his interactions with people. There is truth to be extrapolated from that. Uh, we're changed and transformed as followers of Jesus, not just by believing the truths he talked about, but even more so by practicing the life that he embodied. And I think it's interesting to kind of separate those two and recognize that we kind of separate them, the truths that Jesus preached versus the life style that he embodied. And I would argue we need to merge those two. We have separated them for far too long. But I often think of the way folks that don't follow Jesus, often they separate them in an interesting way. In that many people want to embrace the lifestyle of Jesus, actually. Many people that are not followers of Jesus are just enamored and struck by his lifestyle. The way he lived was the most brilliant life that the world has ever seen. What could how could you not appreciate and marvel at the beauty, the distinct, just awesomeness of how he lived his life? But often, people who don't follow Jesus want to elevate and, and point to his lifestyle without embracing the truths that Jesus said. But I think for Christians, it's reverse. We're big on the truths that Jesus declared, but we don't always embrace the lifestyle that he modeled. And so this question of what is a true believer, I think invites us to wrestle with the fact that we need to merge the two. It's not sufficient to just believe in the truths that Jesus taught without also embracing the lifestyle that he modeled. And picking up where we left off last week, this idea that Jesus invites us into an apprenticeship, that by him putting his yoke on us, that he invites us to learn from him, to receive his instruction, to become his disciple. And it's in the process of becoming a disciple that we experience the lifting of our burdens. Jesus invited all who are weary and heavy burden to come to him, that he would give them rest. And how he would give them rest is that he would exchange our burdens for his. The yoke of the law, the weight of his teaching would be placed upon us as he would lift the yoke of our burdens, our aimless pursuits of trying to find God in all the wrong places, Jesus would make that great exchange with us as he would yoke us into a discipleship relationship where we would become his students and study not just his truths, but the way he lived his life. And as we seek to do that in this series, Intentionally, I wanted to spend time, even though we're going to focus on verse 14, I wanted to make sure that we look at verses 1 to 5 because they're saying something very powerful. A similar theme on some levels to where we went last week before we tackled Matthew 28, uh, chapter 11, verses 28 to 30. 
before Jesus invites us in that passage to rescue us from the burdens and the weights that we carry, he first reveals that he is the son of God and that only he has absolute perfect knowledge of the father. That's an amazing claim, a claim that no other religious leader in history has made quite like the way Jesus did. It's what makes our faith unique, distinct, and also it's what makes our faith, uh, people react to it harshly or negatively because it allows for no middle ground. In these verses, there's another claim about Jesus that's just as strong, if not stronger, when we take it apart and understand it. See, here we see that God the Son, Jesus, is being identified as the Word. Verse 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Verse 3, through him all things were made, without him nothing was made that has been made. It's saying quite powerful things about Jesus in these opening verses. And this, these verses in John's gospel actually mirror a very important set of verses in the very beginning of the Bible, Genesis 1, where it begins with the very same words, in the beginning. Here, these verses begin with the very same words to mirror kind of a creation account, but what's different is that these verses give us a view into pre-creation. It helps us to understand that Jesus was not only with God at the point of creation, God the Father, but that he is also God. And these verses explain to us that everything that was made, everything, everything we see, all matter, space, every particle in this earth that we that we see and study, and all of the cosmos, Jesus created all of it. In essence, these verses are saying that if you and I walked up to Jesus before all of creation took place, and we shook his hand, inside of him would be everything that we see, because it all came from him. He, all, he created everything we see. These verses tell us that Jesus eternally existed before creation, that Jesus is God, that everything we see was made by Jesus. This is quite the powerful truth. And why we begin there is because I think it's important to just keep restating this. We are not studying the life of just a mere philosopher. We're not just studying the life of someone who kind of discovered some hacks to improve and moderately make better human experience. No, we are studying the exemplary life of the Son of God, who was both fully God and also fully human. And that's where verse 14 kicks us into a space of processing just amazing truths that I want us to focus in on. Verse 14 says this, The Word, who is Jesus, became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father, full of grace and truth. See, this is what theologians have called the incarnation. It's this idea that's embedded in these verses that speak of when God became flesh, when he fully became a human being though remaining to be God. And in this moment of the incarnation, that is part of the good news, the gospel. See, oftentimes we talk about the gospel and we'll focus on Good Friday or Resurrection Sunday. But can I tell you the good news of the kingdom of God begins and is experienced and can be received even prior to, to the crucifixion because the good news of God for us broken humanity and this broken creation is this, that God has come among us, that God is near us, not distant, that God is with us. That's actually what the translation of the name Emmanuel means, God with us. That's what we celebrate during the Christmas season, God with us, the incarnation. I remember uh, years ago, my wife's uh, aunt and my mother-in-law, and I think my, my wife's uncle, they all went to a trip to Jerusalem. 
and they were incredibly excited to actually walk the very streets that Jesus walked and explore the land where the first followers of Jesus lived and preached the gospel. And they were moved by all the sites and all the eternal significance that came from these historic sites. But I'll never forget my wife's aunt came back and she began to, to marvel at this one thought. She shared how Jerusalem and all that surrounding area was actually quite difficult to walk because there were gravel roads and, and there was the terrain wasn't always clear. And this is now in our times, this was just a few years ago. And so, but even now there's just terrain that's not easy to maneuver. Um, there's dust, there's jagged rocks. Imagine what it was like back then before roads and things were cleared the way they are now. And she shared this really funny thought that I'll never forget. She said, it's not enough to be grateful that Jesus died for us. He walked for us. And, she, and it just kind of opened up a truth that the incarnation speaks to is that Jesus fully lived among us and he experienced life as we experience it. The day-to-day -day things that you and I could take for granted and, and just assume if we don't really think about it, that God actually knows what it's like to experience waking up and interacting with people and going throughout his day and accomplishing tasks and experiencing setbacks from relationships all around. God experienced all that. He walked for us. Before he died for us, he lived for us. And in fact, the book of Hebrews tells us that Jesus was in all points tempted like you and I. He has the experience of being tempted just like you and I because he lived in this world, a fully human experience. The incarnation tells us these powerful truths. See, when we look at the life of Jesus, we're struck by this one thing. In his life, we get to witness the most flourishing human existence that the world has ever seen. When we study his life, we get a glimpse as to God's intention for humanity. The way he lived it, it, it gives us a picture of what God had created us for, the capacity that he created us with. He had those things in mind when we see how Jesus interacted with people, how he lived his life, how he paced himself, how he scheduled his days, his priorities. We see a glimpse in the life of Jesus of what life was intended to be if sin had not broken our way. And here's where I want to make a little kind of segue but i want to say it's an important segue and at first you're going to hear me go down this trail you're going to wonder what does this have to do with the sermon series this text and i hope that question just keeps you guessing until we get to the answer because i think when we land um it's going to be a really significant thing to assess and process if you've been around church for any amount of time there's probably something you've picked up really like explicitly or maybe just underneath the surface and maybe you didn't have the language for it. There's this sense that I think in the church we have perpetuated where a person doesn't fully feel whole or is not considered to have a fully whole flourishing life until they're married. Unhelpfully, I think the church often we idolize and elevate the state of marriage in such a way that if you're single, you actually can feel like a second class citizen in the church, which is a huge tragedy because single people are such a gift to the kingdom of God. And the season of singleness is an amazing season to be able to serve God and cultivate a deep relationship with him. But when we elevate and idolize marriage in this way, we tend to elevate sexual intimacy within the context of marriage in, in a way that ostracizes and brings shame to single people. And what we're saying as we do this, even though we don't fully say it or say this clearly, what we're saying subtly is this. If you're single, marriage is going to fix your issues. It's going to fix your loneliness. And sex within heterosexual marriage 
That's what's going to heal your sexual brokenness. But can I tell you, as someone who's been married now for 13 years, marriage doesn't heal your loneliness. Marriage doesn't heal your brokenness. Marriage doesn't fix our sexual brokenness. So it's, we've done an injustice by elevating marriage to be this thing that's going to accomplish all of these uh, solutions that we need when, in fact, it actually doesn't. So now you may be wondering, okay, thank you. If you're single, you're feeling seen and validated. If you're in a, in a struggling marriage, you're wondering like, all right, what's, what's my hope now? If, if marriage is not going to fix the things that I'm hoping it'll fix, where do we go from here? And back to your sermon. All right, this was a nice segue, but why did you go there? Here's why. What I believe this means for married people, what I believe this means for single people, when we look at the life of Jesus, is that it actually allows us to see fully what a fully flourishing life actually looks like, rather than putting on the life of Jesus things that weren't there. See, because here's what Jesus shows us is possible when we consider what a, a fully flourishing life could look like when we try to wrestle with this question of the life we long for versus the life we're actually living. When we look at the life of Jesus, here's what his life shows us. It shows us that it's possible to live a fully flourishing life apart from marriage and how this flourishing can be experienced as one practices celibacy. That's a powerful thing to process, especially in our culture that pushes sex upon us so much and pushes it for the sake of pleasure and self-expression outside of the context of marriage. It, 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 we've broken sex in our culture and our society and the church hasn't really done enough good discipleship to really help people heal from that brokenness. But when we look at the life of Jesus, we see an alternate vision of what life can be like, a life that's fully flourishing and it's fully flourishing apart from sexual intimacy, physical sexual intimacy. Why that's important is because I think for married people, we need to ask the question, are you placing a God-sized expectation on your spouse to fulfill what only God can fulfill? If human flourishing can happen, and it did happen in the life of Jesus apart from marriage, then it's important for us to not put expectations and weights and burdens on our marriages that only a deep-rooted connectedness with God can fulfill. Only as we live as Jesus lived can we expect to experience the flourishing that he experienced, again, apart from marriage. So if there's hope for us as single people, then there can be hope for us within marriage. But if our hope is being placed on marriage, then there's no hope for single people. And also if we're placing our hope on marriage that it can never carry, that it was never designed to carry, then everything begins to fall apart. Something to process is, are, are you and I expecting, those of us that are married, that our marriage alone will deliver a sense of flourishing in our life. Meanwhile, in the life of Jesus, we see that flourishing is fully possible outside of marriage. I think of Mother Teresa, and no one would ever think of her life with sadness and say, it's too sad that she wasn't married. It's such a pity that Mother Teresa wasn't having physical sexual intimacy with her spouse. What a shame. No, we would look at her life and, and the lives of people like her that live sacrificially for the sake of others, especially the poor and marginalized, and we would say, that is an amazing life that I wish I could fully explore. We don't feel sorry for people like that. We feel inspired by them. And here's where this all goes back to. You're wondering, all right, this segue is becoming a highway. When is this coming back? Bring us back to the sermon. I'm glad you're thinking that. Thank you for keeping me focused, even telepathically. As Christians, if we are modeling our lives 
after the life of Jesus and not American cultural values, we would never find ourselves in the place of idolizing marriage and sex as the thing that will fulfill us. See, the reason why we idolize marriage and sex as the things that will fulfill us is because we've been basing our values on what our culture tells us will heal us rather than examining the very life of Jesus, not just his teachings, but how he lived day to day and saying how he lived is the key to human flourishing. And if he lived a fully flourishing life outside of marriage and out and without physical sexual intimacy, then it's possible for us to experience life and life to the fullest, even if we are not married, even if we're single. And it's possible to be married and to, experiencing, to experience flourishing, especially if we don't place on our marriage the expectations our culture tells us to place and even church culture. The key to flourishing, the key to having a life that we long for is to model our lives after the pattern, the rhythms, the culture, the practices of Jesus. Let's not complicate it. Let's not add to it. Let's not put any other layers to it. It's that simple. It's not enough to just believe in the teachings of Jesus. We have to examine how he lived and model our life after his life. And when we do that, we will experience incredible flourishing. See, but this is an important thing to kind of pause and recognize that if we don't do this work of merging what Jesus taught, the truths he declared, and the life that he lived, and say a disciple combines both, combines the truth that Jesus lived and declared and the way he lived it and seeks to model our life after that. If we don't do that, a breakdown begins to happen. Here's what I would propose. The lack of imitation creates a breakdown. See, the church in America has had awful moments, unfortunately, of being complicit with perpetuating societal sins. Throughout history in America, the church often has been on the wrong side of history and that we have been complicit and we have been a part of perpetuating awful systemic sins. It's actually quite tragic if you look at church history around the time of the civil rights movement and segregation. There were many denominations that actually were in favor of keeping people segregated and refused to have integrated worship. Could you imagine? It's hard to wrap our minds around that. If, if, a, if people tried to do that now as followers of Jesus, we would put a hard stop on that. and We would point it out. But there was a time in church history not so long ago, just a few decades ago, where that was actually a serious question. Uh, can we integrate? Should we? And many said no. But, but I'll give you other examples. There have been times throughout church history that we have not advocated for women, that women were being mistreated and being viewed as second-class citizens in society. And the church often echoed the arguments and the propositions of society, male-dominated society, to keep women from advancing and having opportunities even though women are created in the image of God and God didn't create them as second class citizens, yet the church at different points in history were actually part of perpetuating these cycles. Why is that? Why has the church often found itself on the wrong side of God's history? It's because if we model our lives on anything other than the life of Jesus, we will miss what we're supposed to do. See, how is it that we could ever mistreat the poor, mistreat the hopeless, the vulnerable, the helpless, if we're modeling our lives after the life of Jesus? See, if you want to know who you should hang out with, look who Jesus hung out with. And he hung out with people that were rejected, ostracized, people that were not accepted. He was not going for the in crowd, even though the in crowd were welcome to be around him. But if you hung out with Jesus, you had to be ready to hang out with people that society would reject and push to the side. And so if the church ever finds itself not loving the poor, not serving the marginalized, not fully welcoming the outcasts of society, it's not because we're taking our cues from Jesus. We're taking our cues from something else.
We're taking our cues from inward selfishness and fear and, and just uh, racism and all sorts of things. We're taking our cues from society. But if you take your cues from Jesus, if you and I learn from him and live as he lived, then it would be very clear that we should always be present and open to those that society would seek to ostracize. There's a breakdown that happens when we don't take our cues from the life of Jesus. See, and in our country, American society teaches us to center our lives around our possessions, our comfort, and often disconnects us from the marginalized. I was actually watching a documentary about these cities that actually have experienced a, a comeback. There's many cities in America that at one time were booming. And then big industries left those cities, whether it was fishing industries in certain port cities or steel in, in like cities like Pittsburgh, that when these industries leave, all of a sudden flourishing cities go down and they begin to experience sometimes decades of just decay and they don't continue to prosper. But this documentary was talking about cities that have experienced a comeback. And what was interesting, one city in particular, Bend, Oregon, one of the reasons why they experienced a comeback and people were moving there in mass and wanted to relocate and establish life there is because they began to design their cities differently. They intentionally began to do developments where people would buy homes and live within a community that had front porches. That was a big difference because maybe decades ago there was decisions made in, in developing houses where it was no longer a feature where you had a front porch. They actually put everything in the backyard. And what did that do? That cut off people from interacting with neighbors. And so now if everything was in your fenced off backyard where that's where you did life and hung out and, and just relaxed, you would never have any opportunity to see people walking by, talk with them. The city changed that and they began to see a quality of life that began to go up as it help people to live where they work and actually experience community in those same spaces. See, there's something that happens when our lives shift in the direction of community, engagement, seeing people, being present with one another that causes our lives to boom. And that's exactly what happens when we model our lives after Jesus. When we hang out with who Jesus hung out with, when we treat people the way Jesus treated people, when we live the way he lived, practicing his rhythms, his life, his priorities, his pace, we can actually experience human flourishing. And the breakdown that happens when we don't base our life off of Jesus begins to go away. So here's what we're going to do for the rest of this series. We are going to seek to imitate Jesus. And I want to give you some, some cues as to things that we're going to get into. One, we're going to look at the fact that Jesus was unhurried. Oh, that's going to be a fun yet challenging sermon to look at the ways that Jesus lived an incredibly unhurried life. We need that especially us as New Yorkers. And if you're watching from any other city that has that similar fast-paced vibe, we need that. We're overstretched. We're living at a pace that's unsustainable. Yet Jesus, the human being that had the most important mission in this life, lived in an unhurried way. If anybody should have lived in a hurried way, it should have been Jesus. But he lived in an unhurried way. We're also going to look at the ways that Jesus was deeply prayerful. You and I need such a reviving in our prayer life like never before, especially during this season. We're going to study the way Jesus prayed and seek to imitate his prayer life. We're going to learn from the very best at what it looks like to have a life deeply rooted in communion with God. Jesus rested. We're going to look at how he rested and the significance of that plays for us. Again, if Jesus can find time to rest, when he had the most important assignment in life imaginable, then I think you and I need to stop putting excuses before us and justifying not practicing rest and Sabbath. We're going to look at what that looks like. Jesus lived in community. He was in intentional, deep relationships with people. 
in a world that seeks to isolate us and cause divisions, we as a church say, no, we are an expression of God's new humanity where he reconciles us and we can be family who were former enemies. And we're going to explore what it looks like to live in community the way Jesus did. Jesus studied scripture. That's an important thing that we often overlook, that though he was fully the son of God, he actually practiced throughout his life the study of scripture and the way he integrated scripture in his daily life. We're going to take a look at that together. Jesus also had real relationships with the poor and marginalized. This is going to challenge us when we explore this because, again, our society pushes us to not see people in vulnerable spaces as fully human beings and to engage with them. But we're going to learn from Jesus, and that is going to change our lives. That that sermon I'm really excited for. And lastly, Jesus lived a simple life. I can't wait to dive into the ways that Jesus practiced simplicity and what that could mean for you and I in our times. We're going to get into such rich content. I can't wait to see all the ways that God's going to meet us. But for today, can I invite us to a place of prayer where we process this big question that we began with? What makes a true believer? And what I want to invite you to consider is what are the ways that perhaps you have sought to believe in the truths of Jesus, but have not imitated the life of Jesus? What are some ways that perhaps you sought to imitate the life of Jesus, but without the life transforming truths of Jesus? We can't live like him unless the gospel changes us. We need both to integrate. I believe right now, if you're opening your heart to God, he's he's speaking to us. He's causing some things to come alive. And whatever he's stirring in your heart, inviting you to this place of true belief, I want you to bring that to God and respond to him in prayer as we close. Lord Jesus, I ask that you would help us right now to come to you fully as you're speaking to us, convicting us, and inviting us to not only believe your truths, but to imitate how you lived. May we take our cues from your life, not from our culture, not from our family of origin. May we live the way you lived and not just believe what you taught us to believe. May we integrate those two things and may that powerfully transform us. Lord, our world needs us to truly imitate you, that they might see your glory again and again. So I pray you'd help us toward that end in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Would you join us in worship at this time? Oh Christ, to be the center of our lives, be the place
do it. Let's do it. We lift our eyes to heaven. We wrap our lives around your life. We lift our eyes. lift our hands and lift up the name of the Lord. He's the center of the universe. Everything and everyone was made for him and in him and through him. There is no one that can compare to our God. No one can compare. The government rests on his shoulders. He's the king of kings. He's the Lord of lords. And he is the center of all things. Sing it one more time. Be the center. Oh, Christ, be the center of our lives. Be the place we fix our eyes. Be the center of our lives. God bless you, Hope Astoria. I'm so glad that we were able to be together to learn from Scripture as we seek to wrestle with this tension of the life that we long for and fully leaning into that. I pray that you would explore what it means to not only believe the words of Jesus, but imitate his life. I can't think of a better way to do that than in the context of relationships. We'd love for you to join one of our small groups. The doors are open for anyone to join in, if you've never visited a small group or maybe you've visited and it's been a while, we are waiting for you to come and be a part of our community so that we might dive deeper into what it looks like to follow Jesus. So reach out, go to our website, see all the small groups that are actively meeting, join in as together we pursue the way of Jesus as a community. God bless you. Have an incredible week.